Okay, let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the new semester. We pray that you will be with us and help us to learn and to equip us so we can serve you better. Give us wisdom, all the understanding. I pray for students who cannot come today to be with them and help them and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, now let's see. I believe that uh, we already covered the first section uh, before I left for Thailand. So I don't remember. Uh, I don't know if you remember about the first section. Uh, the second one, we talk about biblical preaching. So what is biblical preaching? Uh, somebody said that every preaching is biblical preaching. <clears throat> well, it looked like, but in reality, a lot of preaching is not biblical preaching. Why I say that? Uh, when I say that, they are not biblical preaching because they are not concentrated on the Bible. <clears throat> biblical preaching is you teach the Bible in a different way. And you concentrate on the words of God, on the message that God tried to tell the people. That we call biblical preaching. And why I say that most of or a lot of famous preachers today don't preach Bible. What they preach, they might pick up a word or a sentence from the Bible and they make the whole sermon. It's about something else. It's not about God. It's not about salvation. It's not about what the Bible wants us to learn. It's just about this world. It's about society. It's just about all the application, but very little about the Bible. <clears throat> and it look like that they do very well, and people, a lot of people like it and love it. And that's what Jesus said, that in the end time, people will get together the preacher that they want to hear, not the words of God. It's just anything they want to hear. So now, you are the Bible student, and you support to preach the Bible. You support to teach the Bible. Nothing else. That's your job, your calling. So we're going to learn a lot more how to preach biblical sermon. It means that you need to learn the Bible. You need to know the Bible very well in order to preach the Bible to the people. So now this is your first job. You need to know Bible very well. You need to read your Bible all the time. And this is your job. Explain the Bible to the people. Teach the Bible, the words of God to the people correctly. In order to do that, you need to learn the Bible every day. You need to meditate on the words of God all the time. And you need to live by the words of God. Because if you don't believe in it, if you don't live in it, you cannot teach it. You're not real. You are fake. So this is a serious responsibility. Why we need to faithful to the words of God instead of teaching something else? Well, a lot of people think that they can preach, they can teach. Yes, but not the words of God. A lot of smart people can preach, but something else, not the words of God. I went all over Thailand and see a lot of people preaching, and I know that that is not the words of God. They have a lot of good thinking, a lot of knowledge, but not the words of God. And people seem to like it because it's a lot of new knowledge, new thinking, but not the words of God. Now, why the church of God don't teach the words of God? Well, they might get lost. 
in order to do that job well, the leader, the preacher, need to know the words of God very well. They need to spend time studying the words of God all the time. Meditate on it, live by it, and teach the words of God. <clears throat> now, some people might say that, well, if I preach the topic of sermon, can I go everywhere? Well, topic of sermon, just concentrate on the topic, but still, you need to pick the topic from the Bible not anywhere else. For example, you pick the topic of salvation, it still concentrate on the Bible, but you have more freedom to pick it from a lot of places, but still, you still need to preach the words of God. A different style of preaching that we get to learn here, besides topical, we get to learn about textual, we get to learn about expository sermon. That's a different way of preaching, but every style still concentrate on the words of God, on the Bible. That we call biblical preaching. Now, when we talk about biblical preaching, it means that you need to build your whole sermon from the words of God, or the outline, everything have to come from the Bible. And all the theology need to be sound and correct according to the Bible. You can use some illustration, you can use some story from outside, but still you need to bring people to understand the words of God, that's your main job. The whole thing, try to teach the words of God to the people. You try to preach, the message from the Bible to the people. Yet, some people will ask, what the difference between teaching and preaching? Well, the message might not be different. You still preach the words of God, you still teach the words of God, but the style, the way you teach and preach, we make it different. But, some preacher make it the same thing. You might observe some preacher that you cannot tell the difference between he teach and he preach. But by theory, preaching and teaching are different. What is the main difference between teaching the words of God and preaching the words of God? Well, in modern day, teaching means you you talk with students, you dialogue with students directly. You have questions, you have answers. You can go deep where the students need the most because you have two-way communication all the time. But modern day preaching is about you, the preacher, already decide what you want to teach or preach. And you are the only one who keep giving. Yes, the people can respond a little bit, but you already have the whole message plan. In a certain time, what you want to let them know by your preaching. And now another difference is teaching is just emphasize more about understanding knowledge. Uh, it's about the head. But preaching is more mainly about their heart, not much about their head but about their heart, how they feel. So we want it different that way, when you preach or when you teach. The concentration, it go on different way, but still on the words of God. Now we go more deeper about biblical preaching. Is the teaching, the preaching, the words of God. And they want you to concentrate by talking. The text mean that the message from the Bible directly. This is why you read the words of God and you try to let people understand what God tried to teach them. The organization of your teaching and preaching is 
uh, you can say they are different because they have different goal, different purpose. In your teaching, you can go a lot in many different directions. But in your preaching, they want you to concentrate on a certain uh, goal. So that a little bit different style of teaching and preaching. So some people say that if I have to preach only, no chance to teach, how can I let people understand the whole Bible? Yes, you still can do that. If you plan well, the whole Bible can teach people through your preaching. So it can be both ways. Now here in this lecture, we'll talk more about what preaching is supposed to do. Uh, they say that the first thing about biblical preaching, they, call, they use the word incarnation. It means that the words of God come alive. Incarnate means that it become alive. The words is not a dead word. It's the living words. And when you preach, it become alive. The words itself have the power because it's the words of God. And it can give light to the listener, to people who hear the words of God. So we use this word, your preaching need to incarnational, mean that bring light to people. The words is alive. So this is the first job that the biblical preaching can do, keep light. And the words itself become the power of God. The second thing that they use the word textual. Textual means that you combine the Bible with all knowledge from the whole Bible, not just the passage that you preach. Well, you say that the, the Expository try to dig really deep on the spot, yes. But it's still support by the whole Bible. The whole Bible is one message from God. And even you concentrate on a certain part, you still borrow and you still use the whole Bible to support your teaching, your preaching. So it means textual, mean that you concentrate very deep on the words of God, more than anything else. So that is the second job that you're supposed to do. And the third thing that as a preacher of the words of God, you need to contextual, what that mean? Uh, here we mean that you need to apply the message even two, 3,000 years old so, to make it applicable to the modern day people in the 21st century. But you need to understand the surrounding, the context of the Bible two, 3,000 years ago, why God inspired the people to write a certain passage. For what reason? When, why, how? and how it applies to modern day people in the different situation. So you need to understand the context of the words that you try to teach. And you know how to apply it to another situation. In order to do that correctly, you need to understand why God say that words, or why God put that situation there. What is the purpose? What is the context? What happened? You need to know very deep. You need to understand very well in order to apply to modern day listener in the different time frame. But if you misunderstood the context of the Bible that you use, you will apply it wrong. And people will misunderstood the words of God. So now this is so important that you study very well, you understand what happened when you pick up a certain section of the Bible. You cannot use it lightly or don't pay much attention to it.
And so this is some main thing that I want you to pay more attention. You can read more detail when you have time, but I just want to pick up a certain important part that I need to uh, emphasize with you. Now, the last point here, they use the word situational. What that mean? Uh, they say that not be about applying the situation of the tech to in or upon our life, but about helping us see here the tech is addressing us. Now, some people say that we should apply all the uh, message from the Bible to our modern day situation. Yes and no. Why? Sometimes God do not intend for us to apply. When we use the word apply, it means that we need to change to fit our need in modern day situation. But sometimes God doesn't want us to change anything. God just wants us to know and believe and do exactly what God wants us to do, even two, three thousand years. It never changed. So it, you need to understand that a lot of fact in the Bible will not apply or adapt to your time. <clears throat> but it's the fact that cannot change. People need to believe and do the same thing as God wants. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what time change, culture change, situation change, but <clears throat> a lot of fact is universal and permanent, cannot change, cannot apply, but it's the command from God. So in some situation, how you know it? <clears throat> Well, you need to understand the Bible. <clears throat> you need to know what the Bible tried to teach us. So you see that application will work most of the time, but in some time, it cannot. It just have to accept the way the Bible wants us to believe and to do it. <clears throat> So this is the whole thing is we keep the important to the words of God more than the people. Now, what's the difference? We always say that the people is so important, but here we try to say that the words of God is more important than people. It means that the people come to understand the words of God so they can obey, they can believe, they can follow. We're not tiling to change the words of God to fit people's need, but we try to help people to follow the words of God, to believe and to practice the words of God. So this is something that a lot of time we overlook and modern day preachers uh, didn't recognize the importance of the words of God but they just care about how people think, how people uh, want to hear, or how people want to do it, instead of caring the words of God, have to be the words of God. <clears throat> okay, I will stop a little bit, come back for your question and reflection about biblical preaching. So what you learn tonight, change your mind or change your thinking some way, somehow, about your preaching. So in the past, we concentrate, we care a lot about listeners. We want, we want to make them happy. We want to make them come back. 
we want them to enjoy the preaching. But now we say that the most important thing of our job is to satisfy God, to preach his word the way he wants us to preach, to come back to the real teaching of the Bible. And now you need to decide if you do that, then people doesn't like what you do and doesn't happy with that, what can you do? I think I think you are, you know, like if you care about them, that happy. So that means you you only want to please the the people, not God. Mm. Right, John? Yeah, you always have to choose between God and the people. It's like a, a, some preacher, they come to the point where they talk about drinking mm. and they skip that. <laughs> they don't want to talk about drinking. But, you know, when, when they say the Bible, when the Bible uh, mentioned about you got to, you know, you cannot skip it. You can, you have, they have to go, you know, like say whatever the Bible said, you know. Mm. I agree with Ajahn yeah. Kong said because yeah. not just uh, uh, drinking, but all um, also sin. You know, when they preach, they preach about sin. They preach very, very basic. They don't go mm. deep. So yeah. I would tell uh, sometimes I, I kind of like mm. complain, you know, or, or give a feedback to, mm. to the pastor. I say, you know, sin, there's many sin. If you just sin, People say, what is sin? And sometimes they, we don't go into detail. They don't understand. They're going to say, okay, you just mentioned this, so this is sin. So I, uh, I know this is sin. You know, the rest you didn't mention, then to them, it's not sin. Then they, they keep on sinning. Yeah? Mm. So I think you have to go into detail. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's going to be tough. Your job is going to be difficult. But still, you need to decide uh, who you want to serve, God or the people. It might not be easy decision. But if you want to serve the people, I believe that you cannot last long. People change all the time. And they're not going to support you long. But if you serve God, God never change, and God's so faithful, and God's going to be with you until the end. So you need to decide early who you want to serve. Um, will this class be Will you show us how to pull out the scripture? Um, what does it mean to be important to pull out God's word more than our own direction? Yes, we're going to learn how to use the words of God to light a sermon. But you need to have many other classes so you can know the Bible deeper. This class cannot teach you everything about the Bible, but just Try to teach you how to use the Bible to teach people, how to use the Bible to preach to people. So mainly this class is about the mechanism, how to communicate the words of God to the people. Try to help you to have the skill to deliver the words of God to the people. Uh, because you say that in Thailand, most people do not preach from the word of God. And I wonder, what would you mean by not from the word of God or from the word of God? Yeah, yeah when, I mean, when I say that, I mean that a lot of preachers just pick up a word from the Bible and talk everything else. And the theology, the message is not from the Bible. It's from everyone. 
psychology, business, politics, social, but not the Bible. Nathan want to try to say something? Yeah, Ajahn. Ajahn, don't you think that uh, Thai, Thai, Thai pastors uh, learn from our pa uh, famous pastors? <laughs> from Joe Austin? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. Well, modern day preacher try to copy famous preacher. And you know that a lot of famous preacher is not really preach the words of God. Well, to be fair with them, they yes, they preach a little bit, a little bit. But after many years, it's still the same, a little bit. And people doesn't know anything else from the Bible, from listening to that preacher. So the main thing of your job is you teach the whole Bible to the people, the whole words of God. How you that, but this class is try to teach you how to teach, how to preach, and how to manage uh, the way you communicate the words of God to the people in the small group, in the big group. You manage your message into a packet that you can deliver to them in 15 to half an hour or one hour, depends on uh, how much time you have. So we try to teach you how to packet your message in the portion that you can deliver to the people in the certain group, in the certain situation. So this is this class is all about. Uh, I use the word packet the words of God to give to a certain group of people in the way that they can take it, they can understand it. So this class is all about how to write your sermon, how to present your message to different group of people. But the message have to come from your knowledge of the Bible. You ever heard someone who are great speaker, but don't know anything about the Bible? and try to preach the Bible. He can keep talking and talking, but it's not from the Bible. It's not biblical. I used to tell the, the story about a, a loud preacher 40 years ago that I met. He translated the sermon for a American preacher. And when he translated, God so loved the world, you know what he translated? He said, Buddha so loved the world. I think he's innocent because he doesn't know the Bible. He just know the language some. And his God is Buddha, not Jesus. And the American pastor doesn't understand anything what he translates, make him the pastor of the church. <laughs> because he know how to talk, but don't know Bible. Now, if you have to choose between a preacher who know the Bible, but don't know how to preach, and a preacher who know how to preach but don't know the Bible. Which one will you choose? We choose the one that uh, know Bible. 
Chan, uh, one thing I want to know. Someone's a very good speaker. And, but they know a lot the Bible too. So for example, he just used a couple words of the scripture, but he preached like over 30, 40 minutes. So, but everything is uh, applied to the, uh, you know, scripture. It's okay, right, John? Yes, you might call that the, the topic of preaching. If he just pick up a topic and teach people about that topic, and he use all the illustration, all the Bible verses to support, that is okay. But, oh, but, but, Oh, uh, another one. Sometimes he just only talk about his, his uh, you know what, uh, his job. Every time he preach and then he talk about his job. The Bible scriptures, just a very little. So, but sometimes uh, it's not applied to that. So how, how, how about that, that person? Well, your main job is to teach the words of God to the people, not to teach about yourself, but to teach the words of God to the people. So you need to keep going and hope that you can finish the whole words of God or the whole Bible sometime, someday. So you need to go all over the whole Bible, not just a few words that you want to talk every week. Joe Austin just preached about how to be rich, famous. That two things he preached every week his whole life. Okay. Uh, John, uh, yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> I talked to Bob. I said, Bob, he said um, he had three surgery. Uh, he just the last week he was in the hospital. But uh, he thanked God that said, Thank you, thank you, everybody, for praying for him. Oh. And he said, I'll tell all the students and tell John, said uh, he recovered when I was still, but he, uh, they take out all the tumor that, that they think he had, but he don't have a cancer. So oh. he said, that's a good thing. He said, you know, that, that God answered prayer. So he's still oh. in recovery right now. So I just talked to him and he said, uh, I want to, you know, ask and can you pray for him? And what uh, kind of surgery he got? He had, um, you know, like uh, one is for his stand on his heart and the other one is for the lung. You know, like he had three times surgery and then uh, he, you know, he said, uh, uh, they take out, they found out more tumor and they take it all out. So now uh, the doctor said everything is good. You know, everything is still recovered. So it needs need to take time to heal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We can continue praying for uh, Boone. Yeah. yeah. For Bob. So get well soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't called him. He said, uh, yeah, he could. Uh, for the whole, you know, whole uh, Christmas already to, uh, you know, this for mm. three months at least, two, two and a half months. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the other thing is uh, our Monday night groups. We haven't started yet since uh, we take a break. So if uh, student want to continue on, you know, with the Monday night group, uh, feel free, you know, to let us know. And so uh, we can, you know, uh, maybe I, I tell to Ajahn, Ajahn Sufoy, he want to come in. And also the other, the other uh, people that uh, wanted to come in the Monday night is want to learn from uh, is uh, John M. I don't know. Anybody know John M. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He's, uh, he's me and uh, I just, you know, like uh, talking to Ajahn, Ajahn Sufoy from Laos, the one that cat went to church. Okay. And he said uh, he had a Bible study with Sufoy and then uh, called me one day and, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, and we discussed about the Bible and then uh, mm -hmm. Bible verses, you know, and then uh, 
you know, and then want me to explain it. So I said, you know, uh, some of the stuff they're talking uh, in a in the Bible, uh, it's for the future. Like John, uh, John, uh, John talk about is for the future. You know, mm. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. He want to come in, so and uh, I, maybe I should give him the Ajahn uh, uh you know, link if he want to come, you know, join. Join first. I have to uh, give him my Zoom number and then have him come on Monday night, and then we can invite him to come. Okay, yeah. the Monday night this semester, you support to concentrate on hear one another live sermon. Yes. And. <laughs> Another class that you can talk about is uh, the history of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It might relate to your sermon in some way, but uh, you can spend a lot of time help one another improve your sermon. So you need to write a few sermons, each one of you. And you can practice preaching in your group too, and people can help you. Okay, Kat, do you do you want to maybe like on Monday night? Uh, you want to still want to come join? Absolutely, Chang uh, Kong Sai. Okay. So uh, whoever want to come in and join, we can we can you know like uh, help each other. If, you know, mm. I even myself is have struggled in running a sermon. <laughs> you know, I don't have a gift of uh, of preaching, but I. I can do it because using a chance a chance style for years, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, all those three styles that uh, we mm -hmm. we learned. Yeah. So we try to try to use the best that we could, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like a topical. Like usually, I once once a while I pick up the topical mm -hmm. when we have occasion like uh, Thanksgiving or uh, Christmas, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm going to give you a short break now. Okay. So I get lost where I am. Oh, here. Okay, five reasons to study the Bible. Now here, why we study, why we teach, why we preach the Bible. First reason is for spiritual life. A believer cannot grow without knowledge of the Bible. As Jesus said that man cannot live by bread alone, but by the words of mm -hmm. God. So the job of a preacher is feed the people spiritually, a spiritual food, so they can grow. They can get close to God. Without learning the words of God, the people cannot grow, cannot get uh, cross to God. It's not because they come to church for many years, but because they know the words of God, because they study the words of God that make them closer to God, and their life will change when they know the words of God. So this is the first reason why we preach the words of God. <clears throat> and the second reason, we not just stop growing the day we became believer. But we talk about feeding, growing every day. Since your first day of born again, support to stop there. You need to grow. And how you grow? By the words of God, by the teaching, preaching of the Bible. And you learn more, you understand more, you grow more, and you available more to serve God. Without the knowledge of the Bible, nobody can grow spiritually. Even you sit in church for 10, 20 years, you still not growing. And Paul say that they are because they don't grow. And the main reason they don't grow because they don't eat the words of God or the words of God. For spiritual maturity, now, don't talk just about, talk about maturity, mean that you are adult. You can be 
at Paul say that you're supposed to be teacher now, not just student. So that the hope by learning, by teaching, by knowing more and more every day, one day each one of us is going to be mature enough to teach other people, to be teacher and to be one who lead other people in church or anywhere. We don't expect that all people will always be student or baby. We always have hope that at one point, sometime they will grow enough to be teacher or to be leader themselves. Now, the fourth reason is effectiveness. The church that know the Bible very effective means that they can function correctly in the way that God wants them to be. When they don't know the Bible, they fight, they have problems, they don't know how to function, and they just use the knowledge from outside to run the church. And that is not correct. The church have to run the way that God wants us to do. And we need to know the Bible, how to do the way God wants us to do. A lot of churches hire businessmen to run the church, and they treat a church like a company. And that is not correct. The church has its own way, according to the Bible, how to run a church, how to manage everything the way that God wants us to be. So in order for us to be effective, we need to know the Bible. We need to know the words of God. And from where? From the leader, from the preacher who know the Bible and teach the people. The problem is a lot of modern day preachers don't know Bible very well. <laughs> they think that they go to Bible college and then they can teach everything, but Bible college just help them a little bit how to learn. Each one of us still keep learning every day by learning through the Holy Spirit and by studying the words of God every day. You cannot stop learning after you finish Bible college or Bible seminary. Because we know that Bible school cannot teach you everything. They just help pave the way and teach you how to continue yourself, your whole life. So your job still have to learn, keep learning every day with God, with the Holy Spirit. And you can understand more to the point of maturity. And you can be very effective to serve God, to teach the words of God. We never stop learning. And God can reveal new things to you through the words of God all the time. Because this is a living word, it's not a dead word. It has power to change. Now, number five, they say that spiritual delight means that the joy and happiness to learn the words of God, the joy to know more, to get closer to God. So this is a delightful of listening to the words of God or study the words of God, the joy, the happiness that you get by learning Bible. Well, I know that sometimes people feel so tired when they're learning and they don't want to learn anymore, especially from some preacher who's so boring, so bored, and everyone dropped dead after listening to the preacher. Well, something need to change. Either the preacher need to change or the listener need to change. So, but I believe in the power of the words of God. If you correctly teach or preach or chant, the words of God. I think people will be happy and enjoy and feel very good of learning the words of God. So this is something 
that we need to know. Now, conviction. What that mean? The first one is, is an inspired text, mean that this is not man's words. This is the words of God. God inspired people to record what God wants to tell us. It's the liberation about what God wants to tell us. So this is an important book. Before the preacher can teach or preach, they need to connect with God so they can understand what God intends for them to understand through the text. And what else? Inspiring, liberation, and also providence. They use another word, providence. That means God provide. In every word of God, God provides for the listener. Their spiritual need, their physical need, and all of their need will be fulfilled because the words of God provide everything for everyone. And that's why Jesus mentioned that man cannot live by breath alone, but by the words of God. Without the words of God, they don't have life. And now when we talk about is the inspiring, is the liberation, the providence, three words that we use here. It means that it comes from God. It's not man's words. And God showed us the future through his words. And our job is to listen and to share the words of God. So it's not us who teach but God uses us to teach his words. But in order for us to can do that, we need to obey God. We need to spend time with God and study his words. And God can use us. Now, I heard some preachers say that he have just 10 minutes to prepare his preaching every week. Now, when you heard that, how you feel? He said he spent 10 minutes to prepare his sermon each week. Well, the way he say it, not because he doesn't want to spend a lot of time, but he never have enough time. He's so busy with something else the whole week. And when he have to preach, he just have 10 minutes to prepare. And that is not right. That is not good not good for himself and not good for the whole church because the whole church depends on his preaching. And when he doesn't spend enough time to study, to prepare, the whole church suffer. But why even they know that, why don't they change? Well, a lot of typical preachers say that they cannot change because they have a lot of things to do every day for the church, for his family. And to, to prepare a sermon is take a lot of time. And for every week, that's impossible. That we're talking about preacher in America, most preacher need to preach almost every week, unless he's on vacation. But I went to Thailand, I found out that most of the person rarely preach. I met a lot of pastor who preached a few times a year. I asked him why. Well, they say that he's so busy with the church business every day. So he have to invite other preacher to come to preach and most of the preachers that go around preaching every Sunday, several church each Sunday is the Bible teacher at Bible college. Most of them, they have a side job besides teaching at 
seminary or Bible college, it go around every Sunday preaching so to many churches. And that they say that that's the way to help the local pastor because the local pastor don't have time to prepare sermon to preach. And this is have been going on for a long time. When I say a long time, since we can remember anything, it's always happened that way. And that is not good. Why? Because the preacher that come from somewhere else don't know what the people need. And not consistency mean that most of the preacher that come once a while will pick up the topic. And the whole church never really learned the Bible. They just hear something and most of the the preacher that they invite will preach about faith, hope, love, that three main thing. Nothing else. They say, why I preach about something else since people don't want to hear. The popular topic is faith, hope, love, forgiveness, blessing. That's the popular topic. Every week they hear about the same thing, week after week. So that is something we need to change. For a preacher, the main calling is to teach, to preach the words of God to the people that God assigned you to take care of them. This is the main responsibility. <clears throat> so this is the main job. This is the important job for the preacher or the pastor to do, to teach the words of God. This is the words of God, and God wants us to use that word to inspire people, to move people so they get closer to God and they will grow to maturity that God wants them to be one day. And now you look at modern day preacher. Why don't they pay more attention to their teaching or preaching? I don't think that the excuse that say he too busy. I met some preacher, Thai preacher in America. He not that busy, but he still invite people to preach in his church every week. I asked him why. He said that, well, the tradition go on for too long and people get used to get new preacher every week. And he afraid that people will complain that why he keep preaching by himself every week. You know that <clears throat> many years ago, when people come to visit our church, my church, <clears throat> and they come many weeks and they wonder that one day they ask me, Pastor, when are you going to invite someone else to preach in your church? I say that you came to the wrong church. I preached 50 weeks a year here for 40 years now. <laughs> you like it or not? <clears throat> no other preacher. I'm the only preacher. So he in chalk. <clears throat> Never heard a Thai pastor who preached in his own church 50 weeks a year. <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> I think this is my job. My last one. Thing, <clears throat> I want you to see that God put responsibility for you as a pastor to teach your congregation, to preach to them, to raise them up, to help them mature in the words of God. <clears throat> 
Now we talk about when you preach, what you try to do. We try to explain to all people what God intends for them to do through the words of God. <clears throat> and people say that the words of God is all, oh, we have been here for a long time. Well, the message over there, it never changed. It's still the words of God. <clears throat> So, as I said before that, a lot of time God just wanted to tell the people <clears throat> the truth, the fact. And if they can understand it, that's good. And we don't want to worry too much about how to apply that knowledge for their modern day life. Because we know that sometimes God just wants them to know and to believe. And don't need to worry too much how they're going to use that. <clears throat> because we worry too much that some passage might not be applicable to modern day people. So we stop teaching. So the Bible say that we should not worry about that. Just let teach the words of God and let God work in their life. It's not for us to worry. <clears throat> Now here I will quote what John Calvin wrote many years ago. He said that it is the first business of an interpreter to let his author say what he does say instead of attributing to him what he we think he ought to say. What that mean? He mean that the words of God, each book, have intention to say something to the people. And our job as a preacher is to tell the people that this is what God wants us to know. And our job is not tied to change what God tied to tell people, to fit the need, to make them happy. No, this is not our job. Our job is to tell them the truth from the words of God. They like it or not, they believe it or not, this is their own decision. But our job is to tell the truth from the words of God, what God intends for them to hear, to know. It's not our job to change the words of God, to satisfy people and that period. <clears throat> so that is the first responsibility of the preacher or Bible teacher is to faithful to the words of God. Now, they say the second obligation is the people. How we help the modern day people to understand the old, old words of God several thousand years old from different cultures, different languages, it still can apply? Well, yes. The words of God never get old. It's always modern. It's always for all people. So this is something we need to trust the words of God. You just tell people, explain to them what God intention, and God have the way to make them understand and to make them believe and help them use it for their life. Sometimes we don't know how God works or how people get it, but this is not our thing to worry. It's God who works in his own words and chain people. Now, some people say that will people obey the words of God? Well, throughout history, when the words of God is preached, we see the change in people. Not because 
we have power to change them, but the words of God itself have the power to change people. So this is how God works. And we just have to trust God. <clears throat> Let God speak what he wants to speak. Don't try to change the words of God. <clears throat> Now, another section talk about seven key concepts for the biblical preaching. Uh, this is another famous preacher. He advised the first concept how to preach the words of God is and identify the big idea. What that mean? Mean that uh, there is a lot of thing going on in the words of God, but there's a lot of big or small idea hidden there. They recommend us that find the big idea in each passage. What is the main thing that God wants us to know and what God wants us to preach? This is the first thing we need to find out. This is our job. And the second thing, this turn the fallen condition forecast from, this is from another preacher, Mr. Brian Campbell. What that mean? <clears throat> uh, you know that the intention of every sermon is tied to bring people back to God. And it's always emphasized that we fail. We need God. And we always have to come back to God. So this is, they say that our sermon have always thinking that way, how to bring people back to God or bring people close to God. How to reconnect people with God. So this is the second concern that every sermon have to think about. If this passage can bring people back to God or make people get closer to God, so this is the second thing. The third thing, they say that every preacher need to think about how to change people on spot, mean that after listening to the sermon and people don't feel anything, that means that we fail. People need to feel something from the words of God. So this is the whole purpose of a sermon, to inspire people to change inspire people to do some action. They need to respond in some way. Bill Bridget, the fourth thing that a preacher need to do is to bring people closer to God by Bill Bridget, mean that help them find a way to come back to God. They might be far away, but now they see the way to get back to God, that we talk about the bridges. Now they have hope. They see that they can come back to God. So every sermon need to show them the bridge, the way to come back to God. And the fifth thing, don't forget Every passage in the Bible have theology in there. What that mean? Mean that it's not just the simple fact, but there is a deep theology in every section, in every sermon that we preach. So this is something that uh, we need or we have to think that the sermon have to based on the correct theology. And every passage needs to support the main theology. You cannot pick up a certain word and say, Do look, <clears throat> here the Bible teaches something different. Here the Bible talks something that I can use different from the teaching of the Bible. <clears throat> <clears throat> you don't do that. <clears throat> because the whole Bible is governed by a main theology. God is love. God is Trinity. You cannot pick a certain verse to argue with the main theology of the Bible. But some cow leader will do that. 
pick up a, a little thing from somewhere and try to argue the main theology. So that is wrong. Number six. Uh, they say that priest with light and heat, what that mean? <clears throat> uh, the Puritan is the first group that you might call charismatic. When they preach, they jump, they shout, they scream. And today, black churches or the preacher get the same idea. When they preach, they jump, they scream, they shout, they dance, they do everything. <clears throat> but in many cultures, the preacher don't do that. <clears throat> but why they say that? Even you don't jump, you don't running aloud, your preaching still have to light the light and put the heat on people. Mean that you need to make them move. <clears throat> you make need to make them feel the heat that they need to do something. So whatever God inspired you as a preacher to do, your teaching, preaching cannot be simple thing, but inspired by the words of God. <clears throat> now, number seven of the recommendation is preach what is real. Or preach the fact, the truth, not just your thinking but the fact from the Bible, the truth from what God wants to tell us, <clears throat> not from your own imagination. So this is a different thing that we as a preacher need to think. <clears throat> so this is some of the purpose the crowd, the nature of biblical preaching is just <clears throat> to tell the fact what God wants people to know and what God wants people to, to do. <clears throat> <clears throat> so to sum up that, all preaching have to be sanctioned by the voice of God and have a goal, a purpose driven, mean that we hope to change the people by the words of God. <clears throat> Not just tell them the fact, but we hope to change them. <clears throat> and they emphasize again that our preaching need to bring people back to God, give people hope of salvation and offer them the way out of their problem <clears throat> to the words of God. So without doing that, we miss the point of preaching the words of God. So every chance we have is to bring people back to God and get them close to God, to the truth, and help them grow. Every time they heard, they hear the words of God, they grow a little bit more every time. <clears throat> and here they put up some 20 characteristics of biblical preaching. When you see some of them, you know this is biblical preaching. So what are they? Okay, you, you might see that they sum up a few things here for you. They say that the first side is this preaching, make people open Bible, make people read the Bible. This is the biblical preaching. <clears throat> the second thing, the people respect the words of God and the preacher himself revere the words of God with authority from God to share with the people. Now they want us to be passionate, urgent, confident when we preach. Mean that we see it about what we're talking. We, 
we seal it above what we preach. We don't take it lightly. <clears throat> now, number four is we chose the side that we don't trust ourselves, but we trust God and the power of the voice of God to change people, to carry the message through. <clears throat> Now they say that number five is so important. Don't insulting, don't scolding, <clears throat> and don't threatening other people because this is not a good way to preach the words of God. <clears throat> number six, uh, always remember the purpose of preaching is to build people up to help them grow mature in Christ. Whatever we can do, we do it. <clears throat> and the seventh thing, when the, you heard the preacher preach, you can guess that he spent time studying the words of God or not. He have a good preparation or not. You can tell by his preaching. <clears throat> the good preaching always uh, you study hard and you prepare well. <clears throat> uh, biblical preaching care about all the background, the history, the grammar, and everything. Do not overlook the importance of all the ingredients in the passage that you choose. <clears throat> now, number five, they remind us that it's not just a job standing there teaching people, but you represent God and used by the Holy Spirit to tell the people about God. You represent a, a very important person in the universe. <clears throat> Number 10 is mean that the people, when they listen to the words of God, they know how to use them, or at least how to believe. <clears throat> Number 11, people need to feel that this is genuine, mean that it's not fake. You're not acting, but you share the real thing from the words of God. Now, a lot of modern preacher is like an actor. He come to act. And a lot of people come to get entertainment. But this is not the purpose of preaching the words of God. We are not actor and we are not entertainer. Even people come expect to be entertained, but this is not the way a preacher support to do. <clears throat> Well, people need to see the authority from God that using you. When you preach the words of God, you they feel the authority from God, that you have that authority. And this is so important though. Uh, the people, when they heard Jesus teach, they saw the authority. Different from all the Pharisees who don't have authority from God. They're just a teacher but they don't have the power from God. Okay, they say that a preacher have to be humble. It's not about himself, it's about God and the power of God, not um, his own power. Now, number 40, remind the preacher that you practice what you preach. You cannot just teach them and you don't believe and you don't do it. You need to do it and believe in it, really. <clears throat> and number 15, they say that a preacher needs to know how to use the art of listening, reflecting, applying. Well, we learn. But only by God's help, we can do everything. Number 60, remind the preacher, it's not about himself, it's about God. You not come to talk about yourself, you talk about God. You're not, you are not coming here to show up. 
about yourself, but you show about God and His words. So this is always we preacher need to remind ourselves. This is not about me. It's about God and His church. Okay, we always exalted God. We always put God up. It's not about our success or anything. Every preaching always come back to Jesus and salvation. They remind us to do that all the time. And it can be if we get to learn more about topical expository and textual preaching. It can be either way, but it doesn't matter what kind of uh, preaching you use. It's still concentrated on the words of God. <clears throat> So they remind the preacher that sometimes the sermon can be short, sometimes it can be long, but it doesn't matter about the length, but it's about we concentrate on God and the words of God. It's not just about how to entertain and make people happy. It's just about how to share the words of God, to honor God, and this is all some important reminder that we preacher or we need to think about ourselves that we preach the words of God or not. <clears throat> okay, there are a lot of information tonight that you need more time to digest them. I would recommend that if I can do, I will send you the lecture note in advance and you should read them in advance and make note what you have question because without that I cannot go back to cover everything. I just can have some time to address your concern or your question. Okay, you have more question reflection on the or the lecture note for tonight. <clears throat> So with point with part that you care most. I know it's a lot. Can you read in Thai to care? What that means? Say that again. Did you read Thai? Read Thai and read English. Yeah. Okay, good. Kong so Sai can translate all this thing into Thai. I've done all chapter seven of it, John. Thank you. Uh, how many chapter that I already sent you? I think seven or eight. Let me see. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so I sent I sent Kat and Sean. Uh, chapter session one to four right now. Oh, you did not, Kongsai, you did not send me all the translation that you do in the past. Okay, John, I owe you down. That's why I keep sending to students, but I will. I, will. I have it all in my iPad, so. Yeah, send me so I can take a look at them, how the, what what app that you use. Okay. I just want to send you uh, uh, Chesson 1 to Chesson 2. And, uh, okay, I'll, how come, uh, I'm going to go ahead and send you right now, John. See something for you to look at. I know it's a lot of uh, a lot of need to be, you know. <clears throat> Some of them they cannot translate. Just put the English in there. And in the past, <clears throat> what, you trans you use the app to translate every class that I teach. Uh, not every class, but some. Okay. Yeah, I I do like uh, you know like uh, um, from the past. Uh, you know I do in Laos and, and in Thai. Mm. We found out the Thai is has. That's more accurate than than, than Laos. Mm. Yeah. So instead, uh, sometimes when, when the translator Lao the Lao dictionary doesn't understand it, but when when I when I read in Thai, Thai mm. make more sense mm. with English than you know the Lao. So like uh, last week, I was looking at the you know how in the book of uh, Genesis and talk about Lot, uh, Abraham's uh, nephew mm. was baking mm. uh, unleavened bread for the angel or for, you know, 
to eat in his house. Mm. But the Lao, they don't translate it like that. They just say, you know, just uh, make make dinner for the angel, mm. <laughs> you know. Mm. So when I look at English, it said that make an unleavened mm. bread. Mm. And Thai say the same thing too, but not, not the Lao Bible. Yeah. <clears throat> So, Time to come here. Uh, when I was a young preacher, I, I spent the whole week. Every day I'm thinking about the sermon. I work on it every day. So it takes a lot of time. <clears throat> but not all day though, at least maybe 20, 30 minutes think about it, lie something down. But when it get older, it get shorter because I already know a lot. <clears throat> so I will sit down two times. One time is the outline. The second time is to get, get all the main idea down there. If I have the third time to sit down, is to lie more in detail. <clears throat> So the, the knowledge, the skill, help a lot. It make it faster. I send you the session one, John, and to see if John can look at it. Okay. Uh, uh, I might take some time, you know, that right now I teach every day. And I need to get ready to teach every day. Ajahn? Yes. Ajahn? Um, we send you some something. Did you see on your email? We send you, uh, I think, about three, uh, two. two? Forward it. Two, only two? I forward, I couldn't because the computer. Oh, okay. We uh, we send you two. Um, forward it. We interview. Forward it. Yeah, interview, yeah. Yeah, I saw your yeah. interview. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's two of them. Yeah. yeah two of them. I saw, I saw okay. them. Thank you. Okay. And then we have uh, me, me, uh, uh, well, you know, a group we we read on last class. Uh, uh, we finished the chapter fourteen. I think me and Sam, you know, we finished that. Okay, history of the Bible. Uh, I think I just sent you two chapter of the history of the Bible. Is that correct? Okay, maybe tonight I can send you two more chapter. Uh, chapter two is about the Old Testament and how the Old Testament become Bible. So. You see that we have six six book of the Bible. Okay, now uh, in Christian Protestant Bible or Testament, we have thirty nine, but it comes from the twenty four books of the Jewish Bible. So this is mean that whatever we call first, second, or something, the Hebrew don't call first or second, like what we Protestants use. So that's why we have 39 of Old Testament, why the Jews have 24. So something is not the same because we, the way we count the Bible is so different. Now, uh, the Old Testament that we have is the same thing as the Jew we have, but the way we count the book is a little bit different. 
But the Christian church, like the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, have more Bible than the Protestant. Uh, because the Catholic Church add on a few more books that we could talk later on about the Bible. They have more books than what Protestants have. <clears throat> Now, when we talk about the history of the Old Testament, uh, in fact, when we talk about over 39 books of Old Testament, it's the same thing as the Jewish 24 books. But as I say that, we Christian divide on like 1st King, 2nd King, 1st Chronicle, 2nd Chronicle, the Jews don't have first or second. They all combine in one book. So this is why they have less book than us. But in fact, it's the same amount. <clears throat> and another thing is the Jews put the order of their Old Testament different from the Protestant too. <clears throat> But this is not the main difference. The main difference of the Old Testament is uh, the Catholic Church. The Old Testament that we have here, we have 39 books. The Catholic have 46 books. Now you can guess that the Catholic adds seven more books into the Old Testament. And we're going to talk about them sometime later on why they add more books. <clears throat> why the Greek, the Protestant, and the Jews don't accept those books at Bible. We can talk more about that too. Why, uh, that why some book we accept at Bible, some book we don't call it Bible. And here we will talk about the history of the Bible for the uh, Protestant Church, the Orthodox Church, and the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, at the, in the beginning, we all have the same idea. So it, it means that uh, all Christians will start with 39 books. But when we divide, the Catholic will start add more book into the Bible. And the question is why the Catholic start adding more book into the Bible? The answer is they believe that the Pope have the power to lie anything and make it Bible. And the Pope throughout history don't exactly lie Bible, but they collect something from the past that we call uh, other book that the early church don't accept as Bible. Now we're going to talk more about how to make any book to be a Bible. It has to go through the process of selection. And they have some guidelines for both Old and New Testament that they need to pass a certain guideline to be qualified to be the book in the Bible. And many books that don't qualify for the Jew and for the Protestant, the Catholic accept them. Because the Catholic have other reason to take those books to put in at the Bible. So we can talk more about that when we go to the Catholic book. <clears throat> And some of the book that the Protestant and the Jew don't accept, we call Apocrypha. It means that other book is not the Bible. But the Catholic and the Orthodox accept them as Bible. And here is some more about the argument that why some become book. And this is the list that I put up here to compare that the Protestant Old Testament have 39 books. The Hebrew Bible have 
24. But as I say that, it just the children divide in first Samuel, second Samuel, first King, second King, or uh, first Chronicle, second Chronicle. The, the children don't divide, but the Protestant divide. In fact, we have the same amount of Bible between the Hebrew and the Protestant, the same amount of Bible. But the Catholic have 46 books because they add seven more books into the Old Testament. The children don't have this book and the Protestants don't accept it too. Now you go to the Greek Orthodox, they even have more. They have 49 books in the Old Testament. So the Greek also have the reason why they add more. That is about that theology. They need something to support their teaching. So they add those books in to support that theology. Like what we say that we don't believe in a certain thing because it's not in our Bible. And this is why the Catholics support their teaching by adding more books to support their own theology. The theology about Mary, birth, Mary, virgin, Mary, Mary history, the Protestants don't have all those books, but the Catholic load those books and add on, make to be their own Bible. Now, this is some comparison that uh, the Christian, the Greek have in some differences, that four columns, the Jewish, the Protestant, the Catholic, the Orthodox. So most of the book, you see that they are the same. But you see that I will tell you, Samuel for the Jew, just one big Samuel. But for Protestant, the Catholic, the Orthodox, we divide in first and second Samuel. And the same thing for the, the king, Malachim. Uh, the Jew just have one. But the Protestant, the Catholic, the Orthodox, we divide on first king, second king. But the Catholic add third king, fourth king, the Orthodox too. So this is the add on more book here now. The Chronicle, you see one book for the Hebrew, for the Jew. Christian with Protestant, we divide in first and second. The Catholic, the Orthodox do the same thing. And the last column is the language that the original written in Hebrew. And you see that now you see the com comparison. You can see that this is more book than the Catholic. This column is the Catholic. The Protestants don't have Tobit, Judith, the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox add on this book that the Jew and the Protestant don't consider them Bible. And the reason is all the Bible need to support by authority, mean that they know that the author have been called by God, inspired by God. And the book is written by the order of God. But all this book, without that, we don't have record. It just pop up. And the Jew and the Protestant don't accept any strange book that pop up by itself. We need to know that where it come from. And God used that prophet to roll it. Clearly, exactly. But all this book don't have it. But as I say that the Roman Catholic use it to support their own teaching. And the Orthodox do the same thing. <clears throat> they have the book of Maccabee that Protestant and the Jew don't have too. And this is a comparison. Job have the same thing. Psalm have the same thing. And you see that uh, the, the Roman Catholic add more wisdom book that it's not in Hebrew, it's in Greek. And you can guess that when it's written in Greek, it means that it's not the Old Testament time. 
is the New Testament term. And you see that Maccabee, Esla, all these are written in Greek. You know that in the Old Testament time, all the Old Testament written in Hebrew. But when you have the Bible that written in Greek and you call them Old Testament, it doesn't make sense. Because it's written many, many years, hundreds of years after the Old Testament already complete. It's written in the New Testament time, but they add on the Old Testament anyway. And I say that to support their own teaching. That doesn't make sense. <clears throat> so this is more comparison. The Protestants have the same amount of book. You see that with the Hebrew Bible. No add-on, all the same thing. <clears throat> but just the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox, they add on a lot of books. <clears throat> so this is more or less about the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic that add on more books than the Protestant and the Jew can early accept it. Now this is some history how we study about the Old Testament. And there are the history of the scholar, the German, start with the German, tried to go back to study how the Jewish people uh, canonize the Old Testament, where they get all the idea, where they uh, have all their collection. And now you see that the Protestant just start in the 16th century. And they always ask that how the Protestant go along with the Jew. Why the Roman Catholic don't go along with the Jew? Well, the answer is the Protestant believe that the Jew who born and have Bibles thousands of years before Christian, they know exactly what they're doing. So the Protestant accept the Jewish scholar idea and collection of the Old Testament as authority from God. And when you look, we look at the Old Testament, it can divide in four sections. The first section you might call that uh, the five book of Moses. It starts with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy, why we call the book of Moses? Because we believe that Moses is the author of those five books. When we say author, it doesn't mean exactly that Moses sit down and wrote all those books, but it comes from Moses, experience and liberation that God showed Moses. And we believe that there are a lot of helpers that help record what Moses say what Moses teach. And this is become the five, first five book of the Bible of the Old Testament, or the, we call the book of Moses. But we know that God inspired Moses to tell the story, but the record itself come from other author who wrote for Moses teaching. <clears throat> Now the second group from the book of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, King, all these things we call the second, uh, second group we call the history. Uh, it's all the history of Israel and the time of the king we call the history section. The five book of Moses uh, it's also have the name that they call, sometimes they call Talmud or something in the Jewish uh, call. Now the third group, beside the history, we call, sometimes we call literature. 
it's like the book of Psalm, Proverb, all these things in the section of literature. And the last section we call prophet. It starts from uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all these we call major prophet. If you divide the prophet into group, they have major one, the big one, and then the minor one. So this is the first section of the Old Testament. <clears throat> And if you look at the Old Testament, it's not complete in a few years. We believe that the time that God inspired the author of Old Testament from Genesis to the last book, uh, Malachi, it takes more than 1,000 years, or even up to almost 2,000 years. If you believe that a lot of things that Moses told is not record in time of Moses, but before Moses time. But Moses just get the idea out, for example, the book of Genesis. Genesis might exist long before Moses time. Moses time is around 3,500 years ago. So if the book of Genesis that God inspired and God tell people long before Moses time, but it passed on to Moses by the words of mouth, you see that in the old day, they don't write the Bible into the book form, but they have, they call uh, the book by words of mouth, the story that people tell from generation to generation about the creation, about a lot of things that happened before time of Moses, thousands of years before Moses time. But Moses might be the one who collect them, put them in the written form. In the written form of Moses is all the put the Ten Commandments on stone. And that even older than the time of Moses. <clears throat> and what the Old Testament is all about, it's just the relationship of God with the chosen people. Yeah, it starts long before Adam and go all the way to the lie of the people who obey God. Abraham is the lie. And from Abraham is the people of chosen. Abraham have so many children. And we always say that some children don't, are not the one that chosen. You see, Abraham have, uh, Isaac is the chosen one, but, before Isaac, Abraham also had Ishmael, his another son. But Ishmael not the chosen one. Isaac was the chosen one. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And Esau is not the chosen one. Even they are twin. Jacob is the one. And Jacob had 12 sons from four wives. And those 12 sons become the tri the 12 tribe of Israel, the chosen people. So you see that the, the Bible, the Old Testament is the relationship that God have this life of chosen people. God give them instruction how to live their life, the law about uh, how they worship God, the relationship with one another, everything. And this is become the Old Testament, the book that guide them how to live a life of the chosen people. They have the law, the regulation about what they can eat, what how they live their life, and how to do, how they dress themselves, how they have relationship with other people. Everything in the Old Testament is the guideline, the court, the law for the chosen people. And this is mainly, you might say that this is 
uh, the the law of relationship, or later on we call the covenant that God had with His chosen people. And this is between various manus manuscripts. It means that the chart tells us that uh, the Old Testament is not com complete in one time. But there are many sources, as I told said before, that before the written form, the Old Testament is the verbal form mean that people keep telling the story and pass on from generation to generation until most of the time that we believe that things start correcting in the book form. But before that, it just uh, the verbal form. And even when they become the manuscript, when we talk about manuscript, we talk about uh, the ancient way that they wrote on the cheap skin. There's also many versions of them. Because when people put their word into written form, it's also a little bit different. Maybe after many years, people forget some, or people um, add something into the version. So they need to take our version together and try to make correction that which one is the right, is the correct one, which one is not. I compare every version and see. And later on, they will make one decision to be the original or the authority one. So the process will take so many hundreds of years, not in a few years, as we think. It takes several hundred years for them to come together and make decision that which one is the most authoritative, the most correct one that God intend for them to have the Bible. So it's a long process. Generation after generation, they sit down, they talk, they discuss, they compare, or their version of the Old Testament. And wait until they show that which one is the real correct one. Now the Greek version. In Alexandria, allow 280 BC, I mean that about 300 years before Jesus was born. The, the Hebrew Bible was translated into the Greek version. At that time, the Greek is the superpower that ruled the world. And the Greek language is the language of the world. So it makes sense to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek because more people can understand. And even modern day Hebrew understand Greek better than old Hebrew. So there, we, we believe that they call the Septuagint because 70 scholars from 12 tribes of the Jew come together to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek version. And it takes them more than a hundred years to finish their work. So we don't know exactly how they work together or how they divide the Bible into different parts and different try, try to translate that. So some way, somehow, after more than a hundred years, they finish their job, their project. It's a big thing. And they have the collection now, the Septuagint or the Greek version of the and in the Greek Orthodox Church, they still use this version, Septuagint. But as I say that, they add on more books. That they add on later on, uh, 
in different century from the fifth, sixth, seventh century, they start adding on more book. So you see that the Hebrew version have been finished several hundred years before the Greek version translate into Greek version. And the Greek version keep add on more books and take many more, several more hundred years to add more books into the Bible. <clears throat> now, even they have the Greek version, it's not the Greek people who read the Bible. It's still the Jew. But because the Jew in those days speak Greek and use Greek, because the Greek language is the language of the world in those days. So in a lot of Jewish tem uh, synagogues use Septuagint version because the people understand Greek better than Old Hebrew in those days. So the Jew use it, but when the Jew use it, it still have the same amount of Bible as the Jew have. But when the Greek Orthodox adopt the Septuagint later on, several hundred years after that, the Greek start add on more book into that version. So this is not the original version that the Jew have, but the Greek Orthodox have changed the version into what they want. And here's some history of about the old scholar who helped translate the Bible from Hebrew into Greek and uh, the original version, the Hebrew Bible, it had been done long before any historical record. We just can guess how they done it, but we don't know exactly because it takes thousands of years before the history of mankind. I mean the record history though, before the Greek. Now we talk about the Latin, the Latin version uh, when the church uh, in Rome, now you see that the Roman ruled the world after the Greek. And the Roman ruled even before Jesus was born. The language of the Roman is Latin, but the whole world speak Greek. Even while the Roman ruled the world, people don't speak the language of the Roman, but speak Greek and use Greek everywhere. So now the question is why? The answer is the Greek language is a lot more civilized, more better than the Latin. If you compare the Greek Latin is the literature, the philosopher language, the Latin is like the farmer language, low class cannot compare with the Greek. So this is why the people in those days don't use Latin, even the Roman ruled the world. And now why Latin become major language a few hundred years after they became Christian. The Roman church forced the whole world, especially the European to adopt Latin and dumb the Greek. The Roman church make everyone learn Latin. Because the Roman church don't know other language, they know Latin. So they forced the whole world to learn Latin, their language, and dumb the Greek language. Without the Roman church, the Latin will never be the important language. But because of the church, make everyone learn Latin to adopt it. <clears throat> then the Roman translate the Greek version of the Bible into Latin. Later on, they called them 
Latin walked. <clears throat> what truth? Latina. <clears throat> So this is the translation from the Greek into Latin. It's not translated from uh, Hebrew, <clears throat> but it translates from Greek. <clears throat> and we believe that Jolom is the one who <clears throat> translates the whole <clears throat> Bible, the Old Testament <clears throat> from Greek into Latin. So he a superman who can do the job. But we know that he get help from the team of his assistant. <clears throat> he get a lot of help, but he get all the credit because he the head, he the leader. <clears throat> but we believe that he get a lot of help from his disciple. <clears throat> And the Roman church have been using this version of Bible for the past 1,000 years. <clears throat> Very little change to that version. <clears throat> now we talk about the Protestant. Uh, the Protestant <clears throat> will have <clears throat> their own Bible. Start with, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> we know that Martin Luther translated the Bible into German but he did not translate from the Latin version and not from the Greek version. Martin Luther translated the Bible from the Hebrew version of Old Testament and translate the Greek version of New Testament into German. And in England, we know that some other leader in, in England also translate the Bible into English language. The most popular version is King James Version. But before King James Version, we know that some other version coming out, but it's not so popular until the King James Version coming out for the English language. <clears throat> Now, if you ask that how many Greek versions they have, we found out that there are hundreds of versions. Why? Because so many scholars translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And Greek is the language of the world for several hundred years. Every nation learned Greek and they translate their own version. Today, you try to count how many Greek versions that have been translated from the Hebrew Bible. You might say that more than 20, 30 versions that we still have today from all over the world who speak Greek. But the Roman church do not allow anyone to translate the Bible into different Roman versions. They authorize just one version that the church accept. <clears throat> and here we will have more history of Christian in different uh, culture. Uh, Alamec or the Arab or the Old Asian minor also try to translate Bible into their own culture language. Most of them still use Greek, but Greek that adapt to their own culture because the Greek language 
is spoken and used by people for several hundred years after the, the Greek lost their power. And even when the Roman ruled the world for several hundred more years, Greek sealed language of the world. So every country, every nation learned Greek and they adapt the Greek to fit the need. So when they translate the Bible into Greek, it's just the Greek, not the original Greek. Now we talk about the Septuagint manuscript. Why? Because this is the Greek language that have been translated into many nations, many countries. And there's so many of them. Now, if you want to believe, they say that there are more than 2,000 Greek version of the Bible. We don't know exactly, but they believe that there are more than 2,000 versions. Why, as I say that the language, the Greek language ruled the world for several hundred years. And every nation in those days studied Greek, but their own Greek. It's like English. You go to all over the world, they have all kinds of English. You go to India, they have Indian English. You go to the Philippines, they have Filipino English. You go to Australia, they have Australian English. You come to America, we have American English. And when you hear the Leo Beatrice, the English people speak, you say that they speak funny like dialect, but they are the original. But we speak American English. <clears throat> so the Greek have the same thing. American just become superpower for the last 200 years but the Greek become superpower for more than five, 600 years. So the language ruled the world. More than 2000 manuscripts of the Septuagint mean that the Greek version, all different things. <clears throat> and here some scholar try to divide them and tell us where they form, where they are. <clears throat> And this is all the code that they use to identify different Greek versions of the Bible. And this is some the list of the manuscript, where they come from, where they collect, and where they're written. Fifth century, collect in England. The city is London, maybe the Museum of London. <clears throat> the institution that have uh, the ownership is loyal, uh, between library, loyal, something. This is the complete version of the Greek Bible that translate in Alexandria. Alexandria in Egypt in the fifth century. And this is some example of the Greek version of the Old Testament some of the major version. <clears throat> and here they, they use the code B, C, mean that how important they are and where they are. <clears throat> now the list go on, go on. <clears throat> and they say that more than 2000 Greek version. Today we have Bible in English but you might count your finger that there are less than 10 version. 10 version like uh, NIV, NRSV, all this what we call version. And in English language, I believe that we have allowed 10, less than 20 version. If you talk about every version that we ever translate into English that we're still using is less than 20 version. But for the Greek, there are more than 2000 versions. It's just which one you want. 
<clears throat> and now we talk about Jesus' time. Jesus quote some of the Greek version in his teaching too. Why? Because it's the popular version in his time. The Jew know that version very well. In Jesus' time, the Jew, the Jew in Palestine don't speak pure Hebrew. They speak Aramaic. Aramaic is a mixture of language. They have some Greek in there, there's some Hebrew in there, but it's not pure Hebrew. And it's more the language of the Assyrian that rule the world. Babylonian, mixed with Babylonian, and some Persian. Why? Because they are superpower of those days. And the Jew who travel under many nations, many power, adopt and take those languages into Hebrew. So the Hebrew that the Jew speak in Jesus' time is mixed of many languages. <clears throat> So this is why they call themselves Alamek, not, not Hebrew. <clears throat> so this is something that we talk about the Old Testament, how it become the Bible for us. In the next chapter, we will talk more detail that how they select the book to be the Bible and how they uh, protect the Bible without allowing anyone to mix more books into the Bible. <clears throat> okay, I will stop a little bit. This is more history of the Bible, how we get uh, the Old Testament and how it become part of the big Bible that we have today. We will talk about the New Testament next week more in detail, how we get the New Testament. And it's more modern because New Testament is just about 2,000 years ago. But the Old Testament, it go back several thousand years. Well, this is the short version. You can go back and read more detail about the Old Testament, the history of Old Testament that we have today. From the time of Moses, that we believe that he put the verbal word, word version into the written version in time of Moses, that 3,500 years ago, in the Old Hebrew, And the history is about the, the Old Testament come to us in different version, different time frame. And we did not talk about modern version yet because we will wait until we have time in many a chapter in the future. Okay, I will give you time to ask question or your reflection about the history of Old Testament. Okay, Nathan. So, Achar, which of the English Bible that translate from Hebrew to English? Well, every version claim that they translate from Hebrew and Greek. But, do which, believe... one, which, but do, which one do you think that you more reliable, Chan? Uh, it depends. Each version have different intention. But as I say that, if you are the Bible student, you are the semin seminary student, you support to use NRSV. NRSV is the full name is New Levi Standard Version. Why are the same seminary Bible college recommend students to use this version? 
Uh, this version Thai the best to stick with the original. Mm. When they translate, mean that the language might not be perfect English because that is not the intention. The intention is Thai to stick with the original as much as possible. So sometimes the translation doesn't make sense in English but it makes sense in the original language and they stick with the original. So when you study the Bible, you want the version that stick to the original as much as possible. Now the word translation and interpretation, they're not the same thing. For example, when you preach in your church, in Myan, and somebody come to translate it, they call interpret it into English. They call interpreter. What the difference between your, your translator and your interpreter? The interpreter, it come to try to get the message across. They change some, they adapt some, they make it uh, they make it into a different language that people can understand. But translator don't do that. Translator will stick with what the people say, almost word by word. That we call translator. But interpreter don't do the same job. In the Peter, just get the message across. They change the structure of words, they change something, but they, they take the message from one language to another language that in the Peter do. But translator don't do the same thing. The translator try to stick to what the speaker say, words by words or sentence by sentence. Now, when we translate the Bible, we try to do the same thing. But many version of English to the translation, they change to interpreter, mean that they try to get the message across and they lose all the format of the original language. And as a Bible student, you want to keep or the original as much as possible. That's why you need the version that faithfully keep the original as much as possible. <clears throat> when you read the today English version, you might call that this is not a translation, this is the interpret, interpret, interpretation. Why? Because they don't keep the original format. They just translate the message across. That's all. So I answer your question, Nathan. I don't know the main version how they do the translation or interpretation. The Thai version claim that they do the translation, but I'm not so sure about that. I don't know, Ajahn. Uh, mm. Sometimes in Myan is uh, because uh, between Myan from Laos and Myan from Thailand, we are not, we are a little bit different. So sometimes the way, the way they say, I'm kind of, I don't understand what they're saying. So I have to go and get English Bible. <laughs> so, and yeah, even for me, I, I try to use a different kind of Bible beside NIV. But sometimes I feel like I don't understand what they're talking about. So I, use, I will go to NIV and try to understand. And uh, NIV is a little bit easier. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah, but I recommend you as a Bible student, go to NRSV. Because this version is 
better in the sense of sticking to the original more than any other English version. Ajahn, when you when preaching, were you using the uh, same? Like sometimes, uh, you know, whatever, uh, like Nathan said, whatever was the version is easy to understand for you the most, and you can use that version. Well, when you let the people leave, they need a version that's easy to understand. Right. But for you, when you study, you need to use the version that stick to the original as much as possible. Yes. Because you need to know the words correctly. Mm -hmm. The easy version change all the words, change all the concept. They don't care about that. They try to make it easy. <clears throat> so it's, uh, I can't use it, N-R-S. N-R-S-V. Okay, uh, N-R-S-V. Yeah. New revised standard version. Yeah, new <laughs> revised standard <laughs> version. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> so this is why when you go to seminary. For master degree MD, you need to learn Greek and Hebrew language too. So you can go back to read the original and try to find out that the translation is correct or not. John, a little bit more now. Hmm. <laughs> to learn the Greek and Hebrew. Yeah, we don't learn how to speak. We learn how to translate the difference. Because the Greek and the Hebrew that we learn is the old, old Hebrew, old, old Greek, not more than one. It's like you try to learn Lao of 500 years ago Lao, not more than the Lao. It's so different. Ajahn, what about the Thai language too? They have their old version and they have the 1971 version. You know, even today, I went back to Thailand and I heard people talk and say, oh, this is a new Thai. Uh -huh. They have different slang, different phrases, and the way they speak is so different from my 50 years ago Thai. I believe that you go back to Lao and speak Mian with the people there. They say, where you come from? You understand each other, but not the same anymore. You go back to Lao and speak with the Lao people, you will be surprised that the Lao is different from your Laos. Yeah, Ajahn, Jeeves was, was telling the story about, not this time, but about, the, sorry, about five years ago, they went back to Laos and he was, talk he was talking to one of the uh, uh, Lao person. He said, you Lao is all Lao, not, not new Lao. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I told them my Thai is 50 years ago Thai, not more than Thai. <laughs> wow. <laughs> antique, antique Thai. <laughs> yeah, we preserve it. And people always surprised where you come from. <laughs> You know, I, I get so tired explaining to people that I am a Thai. I born in Thailand because they always ask me, where you learn your Thai? You speak Thai very well, but different. <laughs> now I just accept that. I just tell them I learn Thai. So I try to think that you are Chinese. Oh, all things except Thai. They don't believe I'm Thai. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't. You don't look like Thai. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. The worst thing is they're going to charge me double for everything. You know that in Thailand, there is a 
the the price for Thai people and foreigner. I got it one time, Chan. Yeah. When I go there, I didn't uh, show them my passport and that I just go get the loom. I use Thai language and then mm. it said about 1500, uh, like a 1500 baht. And then later on, uh, the counter want me to write out the address, everything. <laughs> uh, English and then, oh, no, no. <laughs> 3,000, 3,000 baht. I said, no, we already signed everything. <laughs> not pay you that. <laughs> and uh, if you try uh, the uh, tomorrow, if you're not, uh, you know, go somewhere. If you try to stay here again, and then uh, you have to pay. I said, okay. <laughs> but tonight already. <clears throat> I, I, got I already have a contract. And then I signed and we said, no, you don't pay for that 3,000. Well, that is not the written law, but everyone know that there are two different prices everywhere. Yep. <clears throat> exactly, John. Yeah, different Thai and different, uh, you know, when I go over there, I try to get the noodle, but I see that the uh, menu, they already have picture. I just put, I want this noodle. And then she said, no, you have to choose this and that, that. Mm -hmm. I said, you are not Thai. You don't know how to do it. He said, I am Thai. Said, you are not Thai. I already see that picture already, everything complete. I just choose this manual, this picture. You just do based on that. She said, you have to choose a noodle. I said, that's already complete. <laughs> and then I talked to her, I said, oh, you are not Thai. You don't know uh, Thai language. And, she said, I am tired and <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> oh, just a reason about uh, three weeks ago. Hmm. Yeah, you know, original Thai now. Okay. New Thai, new, new version. Hmm. Now they probably look at you, you look more Chinese than Thai. Hmm. Right? <laughs> Cambodian. Somebody. Farm she said uh, Chinese. Hmm. Me a Chinese. And I and I told them that oh I don't understand. So they said, Oh, you're not Chinese. It's okay. You are Myanmar? Hmm. <laughs> you are dark. <laughs> but today there's so many uh foreigners working in Thailand in Bangkok. Or Myanmar, right? Uh -huh. Oh, everywhere come to Thailand to work. Uh -huh. I found out even Chinese people come to work in Thailand, a lot of them. Yeah. Mm. From everywhere. Ajahn, I don't know what the mean translate about the Bible. Sometimes I see uh, English, they don't have a, a you know, a title. But Mian and Thai, they do have a title. Well, I think they try to adapt to the culture. Yeah, when I see the English, they don't have a, a title, but I see because of we translate from uh, Thai. That's why Thai has a, a title. Yeah, I believe that even the Lao version, the Lao version either translate a lot from Thai and a lot from English. Mm. I believe the main version that translate in Thailand also use the Thai version as a standard. Yes, pretty much. Mm. And how about um, what do you expect from this class of that? Well, this class, we want to learn about how we get the Bible, where it comes from, and what 
the future of the Bible going to be? And what impact of the Bible to the whole world? Mm. Wow, so, that's so hard to talk. <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere, it's everything. So we have a different option. Last semester, we learned about church history that a lot of leading to, but here is more concentrate on the Bible itself, how we get the Bible. <clears throat> The Bible itself have a long history. People try to destroy the Bible, try to burn down the Bible throughout history too. But the Bible survived. <clears throat> In our recent history, you see the communist burned down Bible. So what project that you want to do for this class? Ajahn, you say we have to um, prepare sermons. So I think that's a lot of work. Yeah. I will try to get Ajahn Sam uh, help me and San. <laughs> <laughs> Ajahn Sam, he uh, stopped preaching and um, Frank, Frank likes it. He said, very good. Mm. So I think he must be a good, good preacher. <laughs> <laughs> so you might try to translate a chapter of the Bible into another language. Yeah, I'm planning to do that, that too, mm. yeah. Um, I, I started, but it's a bit hard, but I'm uh, mm. trying to finish one, one, one chapter, uh, uh, I'll try. After I finish it, I, have to, I, have, I will have Sam to uh, uh, double check. Mm. <laughs> His mute is good. Mm. And we're gonna do a little bit research on uh, on the Mian Bible, like when mm. the start yeah. and and I got some information and I look into it, but I know that you know it takes them like almost they all almost I think they started in like almost nineteen thirty. Thirty-nine started with one of the uh, Vietnamese missionary, so it's yeah. like they only translate Bible to Bible only when they needed it. They they translate it and then they use it to teach. So I got some information and I'll see if I can can uh, put it together. That's a not good project. Yeah, so I would I would do that do that project. So it's not gonna be easy though. I look at them and I uh, I, I get a headache. It's, I'm all confused, you know, because. There's so many information. So you can do the history of Bible in your language. Yes. Well, whatever Nathan do, I, 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 we work. We work together. Um. And with San and Chai, so we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll you do. can work as a team. Yeah, as a group. Yes. You can look at the Lao version. That how the Lao have Bible. Uh -huh. The Lao Bible, or Thai Bible, Mian Bible. <clears throat> right. Because I was looking at the uh, at the paper, it says that uh, when they translate, they don't just mm. translate uh, uh, into only Mian, but each time when they translate, they translate it into three languages. That's mm. or four each time. <laughs> That's how they use it. Not just, just, not just only the Mian can use it, but Thai or Lao, uh, mm. Chinese, they can use it. That's what I say. So I need to spend more time on it and mm. 
what I can, I can come up with. Okay, that's good. You can think of other project related to the Bible, the history of the Bible. Uh, how to use the Bible in different format. <clears throat> Not just the written format. Today you can do the digital format or the uh, verbal format. In the past, we just have the written one, but now we have so many kind of Bible in different format. You can study the history of different format of the Bible. Okay, you have any more question or suggestion? So I will send you chapter, let's see, chapter three or four. You already have two chapters though, one and two. Yes, John. Okay, I have chapter three and four to send to you maybe sometime uh, tonight or tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I send my time. I send you all the um, translation from uh, session one to seven on the uh, preaching, and then uh, one and two to the uh, on the church history. I mean, not okay. church history, history of the Bible. Okay. But uh, in the past, you do the project on translation too. Yes, I did. I will send you all that too. Okay. Uh, but I will not make it like a folder. But I'm just go ahead and send you. Uh, chapter by chapter. Okay. Okay. I'll go back and send that to you. Okay. Anything else before we're done for tonight? Okay. You have the meeting on Monday. So I encourage you to join the group. You need to work on your sermon. That one thing. Yeah, I think we all need to learn. <laughs> I mm. need to learn too. Okay. Okay, let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you that we all can come back for the new semester and leave all students up before you. Be with them and help them and help us that we can learn from one another and support and help each other to serve you. We thank you for everything in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, God bless you all. I, I can. Yes. Maybe I stop by and see you tomorrow. Take a look. Oh, okay. What time are you coming? Uh, what time are you coming? What time uh, are you going? In the morning, okay. Okay, I stop by in the morning. Okay, Ben. Okay, Gap. Hi, Ben. What time are you going, Bye. Ben? Hello, hello. Ben, what time you go? And uh, I need to see a chant. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, John, maybe I'll call you later. Okay. I have to cross the bay and then uh, for the service also. And then maybe I just, uh, you know, take advantage and then to stop by your house and then. Okay. To bring you the tuition, whatever. Okay. I don't know. I miss you. <laughs> Bye. Okay, uh, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. -bye. Good night. See you all.